Hello again to uh, Strategic Visions 2020. I'm Stan Grant. I'll be your interviewer and, and host for this evening. Um, what an extraordinary year it's been. I don't think any of us would have imagined at the start of 2020 or at the, the end of 2019 that this is where we would be with economies in free fall, um, a global recession, if not a depression. Uh, in, it's extraordinary numbers of deaths around the world. And of course, Australia, like so many other countries, our lives turned on their heads, um, isolated, um, locked down in some instances, um, separated from, from family. Uh, the economic impact, as I said, has been just catastrophic. Uh, and we are still in the early stages of coronavirus. What will this mean? What will this mean for our health? What will this mean for our, our politics? What will this mean for how we live together? What does this mean for the future of industry? There are all sorts of questions from civil liberties to, um, to, to, to questions about uh, who has handled this most effectively. And we have two fantastic guests to, uh, to navigate this with, uh, with you this evening. Professor Rona McIntyre is one of the world's leading infectious diseases experts and has become very familiar to all of us, Rona. You've, uh, you've attained a level of fame where you're probably at first name basis now. If I say Rainer and I say COVID-19, people know who I'm talking about. And Professor McIntyre, of course, is also a professor of global biosecurity at the University of New South Wales. And we're, we're pleased to have her with us. Jane Holton is a, a longtime bureaucrat at, at very high levels, former secretary of the Department of Health, former secretary of the Department of Finance, among many other positions, former executive board member of the World Health Organization on the Council on the Aging, of course, a board member of ASPE uh, and heading an inquiry into hotel quarantine, which has been uh, an issue here that's clearly been occupying a lot of a lot of time, a lot of headlines uh, and a lot of speculation. So there's a lot to get through. Um, I'm glad to have both of you with us. Send in your questions and your comments. Again, we'll um, try to reflect those over the next hour and a half as well as we continue this conversation. I wanted to start, Rainer, first of all, by getting an assessment from you of just where we are at right now. Clearly in Australia, um, we thought we were over the worst. We eased the lockdowns and we've seen what's happened in Victoria. Borders are closed once again. People are, are restricted in their movements. There are curfews and businesses closed. And if you look globally, we continue to see the cases rise, the number of deaths rise, and uh, this has just had such a devastating impact on all of us. So your assessment on where we are placed right now in Australia and also globally. Well, I think we've got bumpy riding um, to some extent. Are you hearing an echo when I speak? No, no. Are, are you hearing yourself back at all? I am. If you can't hear it, that's fine. Um, so, you know, we're in for a bumpy ride because the pandemic is getting worse um, every day globally. Um, in many countries, the surveillance and the testing is pretty limited, so the numbers that are being reported are probably a vast underestimate. Um, so the whole situation of having the international borders closed doesn't look like it, it can change in the um, medium term. Um, in Australia, of course, the majority of the population is non-immune to the virus, which means that all it takes is one person, you know, spreading the virus um, inadvertently that could set off an epidemic, which seems to have been what happened in Victoria. And really the whole country is susceptible to that. Uh, New South Wales and Victoria are more susceptible because the greatest number of international travellers into Australia come into those two states. So, um, and really when you look at New Zealand as well, which is a great success story, the number of international travellers coming there are quite small compared to Australia. So in a way it's been, um, less uh, less of a challenge for them to get it under control. So uh, Raina, the, the, it does raise a question. I'll come to Jane in just a moment. I just wanted to explore this with you, and that is the question of the strategy here. Um, initially, we were told that there was a suppression strategy, a flattening of the curve, and that would allow us to get things in order to establish a number of, you know, to equip our hospitals, um, increase the number of ICU beds and the capacity to deal with, with people who may be hospitalised. Uh, and then as we've seen this continue, there have been discussion around moving from suppression to an elimination strategy. What do you see going forward? 
So first of all, there's been widespread misuse of the term elimination and eradication, which are technical terms, which are, um, you know, usually uh, arise when the WHO sets a goal for global eradication. The only infection to be eradicated so far is smallpox. Um, there, there are current goals for measles and polio eradication. And within that context, countries then set goals for elimination. And within that, there is a set definition of what elimination means and ways that it's measured and quite rigorous criteria that have to be met to, to define that you have achieved elimination. And we don't actually have a definition of elimination for COVID-19. It's just a term that people are using. I think what people mean in Australia when they're talking about elimination versus suppression is zero community transmission and trying to just maintain that status um, as long as possible, which is what New Zealand has achieved. Suppression, um, again, I think there are, is some misunderstanding around it, but some, I think there's there's a misperception that suppression means you can just live with a small amount of community transmission and it'll be okay. It'll never be okay to live with a small amount of community transmission because the majority of cases, 80% say, are, are mild or even asymptomatic. Um, this is one of the big problems with this virus is that you can get transmission with, from people who don't have any symptoms. And so you can get quite a lot of epidemic growth from one generation to a next, so one person infects two, infect four, infect eight, etc., before it's actually even apparent that there's an epidemic that's grown. Um, and that's why the suppression strategy is, is quite risky. Uh, I don't think it's possible to live comfortably with a level of community transmission. So, Jane, what does that mean for us? If we can't live comfortably with a level of community transmission, if there are people who are asymptomatic, and we know that, if this is the early stages of coronavirus and we're still finding out more about this disease, where does this leave us? What what lies ahead for us? So, I mean, I, I think this is exactly the $64 billion question, isn't it? Because we know um, that New South Wales at the moment has a small number of cases, but I think the Premier described it the other day as being on a knife edge. Um, there are sort of little sporadic outbreaks uh, in a couple of cases where they don't know the source, the cause, um, most recently at a fairly well-known girls' school, and that number, I think, is now in the um, in the high teens. So the question we have is, and I think Rain has gone to the nub of the issue, um, is it plausible to have small numbers of cases sort of grumbling along in the community that our contact tracers can follow through, get to the bottom of, um, make sure people isolate, uh, deal with anyone who is unwell and enable everyone else with the kind of restrictions that I think we're pretty much familiar with in place and that that um, enables us to go about our business until such time as we have better treatments and, as we all know, the thing we aspire to is a vaccine. So, I Jane, so, so sorry, that, that is a very long-term strategy. Yeah. Um, and, and it puts a lot of pressure on on the ability to be able to contact, trace and identify, exactly. be able to deal specifically with those out. Are we up to that? Are, are we dealing with that effectively? Well, um, I think what we've all watched is the Victorian experience where there has been real uh, trouble doing that effectively. And I think we know that people from around the country have been helping in the effort in Victoria. Uh, the military have been helping uh, I know uh, people here in the federal department have been helping. So the question for us is how many uh, people do we have nationally to do that work? And if we had outbreaks in a couple of states, would we have enough people to do that work? And I think it's a serious question because I think it then informs your strategy. Um, should you be going for uh, zero community-based transmission uh, because then that keeps the pressure throughout the system uh, lower and manageable. So what are your thoughts on that, Rainer, our capacity to, to continue this? It's been described as a whack-a-mole approach that may be a bit a bit harsh, but, but this ability to be able to trace it, deal with it, try to keep it under control while we all hope for a vaccine, what's your thoughts on our capacity to do that long term? So, I mean, I agree with what Jane has said, and... You just have to look at what happened in Victoria, you know, in the low double digits for a few weeks and then in the middle double digits and all of a sudden it's hundreds and hundreds of cases a day for a sustained period. 
for every one case, um, on average, there's 10 to 25 contacts to be traced. And if you don't trace them within 24 hours and put them in quarantine, it's going to blow out of proportion. It's really going to blow the epidemic. You have to trace those contacts. So the biggest um, limiting factor is the human resources capability to trace those contacts. So we know that there've been sort of 2,000 people on the contact tracing job in, in Victoria. But, you know, say one of those days when you had 700 cases plus, you might have anywhere between 7,000 to 20,000 contacts to trace just on that day. So you can see how difficult it is. Um, and I think unless it, when you, it really becomes impossible when you've got large case numbers. And unless you really embrace digital contact tracing, I don't think any country, no matter how wealthy and well-resourced, can keep up with the contact tracing requirements. We've already had a, a question coming in. And it's something that I've read about, and it's something that's been speculated a lot about as we try to learn more about this disease and how we can actually combat it. And that is how it's transmitted. Um, there's been a lot of speculation about, you know, initially should we wear masks? Now it's it, it's deemed to be mandatory, particularly in places like like Victoria. Um, questions about about whether it's transmitted um, through particles in the air, whether it's airborne. Rana, what are your thoughts on, on that? What are we learning about that? I think it's um, turning out to be quite similar to SARS. So it's transmitted through multiple modes, through droplets, contact, and the airborne route. Um, the WHO acknowledged in early June that particularly in indoor spaces that are poorly ventilated, there is a risk of aerosol or airborne transmission. Um, which is, I think, why it's quite difficult to control, particularly when people don't have symptoms, because some of the other studies have shown that um, you can just breathe the virus out or coronaviruses can just be breathed out without a cough or a sneeze. Um, and that's where masks um, could have an important role in reducing that risk, both by preventing the wearer from onward transmission if they're asymptomatically infected and also from protecting a well person from breathing in or being splashed by droplets. And Jane, would that explain why we've seen particularly virulent outbreaks of this in enclosed spaces? We, we know about the, the, the cruise ship examples, for instance, but nursing homes, especially where people are locked in uh, and, and it, once it takes hold, it just seems to spread so quickly with such devastating effects. effects. Could that then be part of the reason here that we're learning more about how it's spread and it's spread in multiple ways. Well, it is spread in multiple ways and I agree with Rainer. It does remind us very much of SARS, which used multiple modalities to basically infect people. I mean, I think the thing to remember here is that the good old fashioned non-pharmaceutical interventions, distance, mask wearing, hygiene, actually really do make a difference. And the evidence for the effectiveness, particularly, for example, of masks is very clear. Um, IHME, which is the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, has done a global analysis which demonstrates a minimum of a 30% effectiveness, even if mask wearing isn't done in the way that some of us would like. Um, and there are other more recent studies that suggest it may be actually much higher. So we know those things work, but of course, if people aren't um, in using those techniques, the risk of spread, particularly as Raina says, from those droplets is very high. And Jane, if there is a, a break in the chain somewhere, we know how easily things can get away from us. And I don't want to preempt your inquiry into hotel quarantine, but we've already seen speculation about Victoria uh, as a source of that renewed outbreak. It, it goes to show, doesn't it, that it is so difficult to maintain, even with the best of will, even with the greatest vigilance, even with the, the, the greatest scrutiny, how difficult it is to be able to hold on to this regime and manage and manage our, our way through this crisis? Well, one of the things we know is if there's any gap in any system, the virus will find a way through it. Uh, that is just inevitable. And so making sure, particularly those systems that we rely on in terms of biosecurity, that they are seamless and end to end is fundamental to giving the whole community assurance uh, that they are being protected and safe. And as you said, um, places like aged care, let's be honest, most elderly people weren't moving about. The virus has been moved between rooms in those circumstances. So understanding those things and making sure we're informed about what provides protection 
is really important because I think as Rain has already indicated, uh, you go from one case to 10 cases and often if it's in young people who are asymptomatic and otherwise well, before you know it, you have an enormous outbreak that is very hard to get under control. So Raina, how do we do this going forward? We know that people dealt with that initial lockdown period, um, the restrictions, uh, you know, people engaged with that and they seem to accept that. It's becoming increasingly difficult. We're starting to see these things fraying at the edges and increasing civil disobedience. Um, we're seeing in Victoria the, how onerous it is to go back into lockdown again um, and we'll deal with the economic impact in just a moment. But but how do we build a sustainable strategy knowing that there are limits to tolerance and limits to people's capacity to deal with this? Yeah, it's very hard. Um, I think one of the problems that actually has been the success of the Australian response at the beginning, which means that it wasn't a reality to most people. Um, they, you know, if you'd been living somewhere else, you might have known someone who died or known someone uh, someone who you loved may have ended up ill. So it wasn't a reality, it wasn't tangible to people here. And But I think in the, in the end, we're all going to have to change the way we live. And that's the only way to manage the risk um, in a sustainable way until that time when um, we can have a vaccine. And like Jane, I'm optimistic as well. That, yeah, that, 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 that question of a vaccine, we will, we will come to. Um, but, yeah, but I think so. we, have, we have to learn to live differently. We, we really have to take it seriously, the issue of physical distancing. Um, you know, when, I'm at, when I've been out and about recently, I haven't seen people physical distancing in Sydney, you know. Um, uh, you have to wear a mask. Um, you have to wash your hands. You have to get tested. If there's any indication, you need to get tested. Um, and I think we also need to look at... So... so in addition to the things that the government does, I think people need to take responsibility and understand that everything that we do also makes a difference. There's only so much that government can do. Um, and I guess the enablers that help people to, to comply with those things which the government has been providing are also really important. So the mental, looking after mental health, the um, financial side of things, job seeker and, and all of those kind of supports that people need if they can't work, if they're in lockdown. But the other thing is that if we all observe those um, precautionary measures, we may not need to go into lockdown. If everyone wears a mask and keeps their distance, we may avoid having to go into lockdown again. Um, that's the way to look at it as, as interventions that don't take away your freedoms but actually allow you to retain your freedoms but living a different way. Jane, one of the things that Raina said there I think is, a really, is really pertinent, and that is that Australia, our success um, probably led to a degree of, if not complacency, then a little bit of apathy. How do you convince people to take something seriously when they don't necessarily see that it is serious? Um, mm. Yes, there are deaths, but we know those deaths are predominantly um, overwhelmingly in people who are elderly, usually people who have other complicating factors or existing illnesses that contribute to that. Um, you see a lot of recklessness amongst younger people who just seem to think that it doesn't affect them in the same way. We hear overall about the, the, the death toll and there are figures put around it could be 2%, it may be a little higher than that. Um, we still don't know because we don't know how many cases there are. There are so many unanswered questions and I could certainly understand how people would believe that it's not going to affect me or, or I don't take this seriously because it isn't serious. Do we have a problem in the messaging there? So as you've hit on one of the things, Stan, that I, I am actually quite concerned about, and you're quite right. Um, Australia has done very well, not quite as well as New Zealand, uh, which I know we're a competitive lot. We should aim to be as good as New Zealand, if not better. But the truth is, that for many young people, uh, this isn't their primary concern. And so we, we're advocating for people to do the right thing and to consider the health and welfare of grandma, etc. But we know for the group between the ages of about 15 and 44, their most predominant concern is actually uh, their job, their capacity to pay their mortgage, uh, etc. And I do think that there is a point at which 
whilst we all need to encourage uh, people aspirationally to do the right thing, I think there is a point where we need to encourage people to think about what the self-interest in this for them is. Because you're right, most people here don't know anybody who's been affected. Um, I actually have one of my board members in London who ended up in intensive care. He says it's the worst thing that had ever happened to him in his life. And he's a professional virus hunter. Um, and he found this one by accident and he did not enjoy it. He was very, very, very ill. So, I mean, I've got experience of people I know very well and I'm hearing their first-hand accounts. And this man is a healthy, not elderly gentlemen um, but I think we do have to communicate with people not only in the languages that they understand and I think there's a whole discussion to be had about that but in relation to the messages that they will relate to because if you're locked up in Victoria at the moment and for anyone who's in Victoria um, we are all thinking of you every day but you haven't been able to go to work um, you are potentially struggling uh, with that experience and with uh, financial concerns. And what we can all do is not only protect um, the elderly, the immune compromised, and can I say our health workers, who we absolutely need to put at the front of this, but we can also make sure that we can go to work and that the economy can actually work. So I, I think we do need to think about how we communicate to people and not just always say, do the right thing, because that isn't necessarily some people's principal concern. And Raina, um, that message, you know, that we, can, can we have it all? Can we deal with the virus and get back to work? Um, people, if someone faces the choice between, you know, they, they have a, a, a slight cold symptom, do they go and get tested and have days off work when they have job insecurity and they need to provide for their families? Um, businesses that are now heading to the wall, can we possibly reopen, get back to work and deal with the virus, knowing that we don't know so much about it? Um, we can if we get to a stage like New Zealand where we don't have community transmission. Maybe we can with a very low level of community transmission, but there will always be a risk if, if we have con community transmission of um, further epidemics. So, you know, some of the modelling research shows that we will have recurrent epidemics and we'll live with periods of normalcy in between those epidemics, and then we'll have more epidemic periods, and then we'll sort of do all the social distancing lockdowns and then get back to some <clears> level of normality. So it'll be cycles of epidemics and inter-epidemic periods. Um, so I don't think we can have it all, but we can. We have to learn to adapt and um, work around the, the challenges of this virus. Uh, Raina, you mentioned we mentioned New Zealand a couple of times now. We know that they really went into a hard lockdown. They got on top of it and eliminated as much as possible that community transmission. But is it a case that it's just so much easier if you're dealing with a, a much smaller population, even more isolated than Australia, um, with a big ocean around it to stop other people coming and not having a land border? Has that also contributed to our success? We don't share a land border with other countries. We're not dealing with the sovereign decisions of neighbours that may ultimately impact on us. Um, is distance, is geography a factor here in dealing with this? And what are the, if this so, what are the, what are the consequences of that? Yeah, it definitely is a factor. Even in the 1918 pandemic, Australia managed really well and delayed it for a whole year because of the island nature of the country. I think um, it's something we should use to our advantage. We have used it to our advantage. You know, the closing of the borders early on was able to be done completely because we don't have land borders with other countries. Um, so we do have that natural advantage and it's something positive that we can um, use into the future. And Jane, that though means isolation, doesn't it? I mean, how long can you keep the world away? Mm. So one of the things, and of course, this is the, the, the 64, again, billion dollar question, um, how much travel in and out of Australia do we need to keep the place ticking over? And there are people who do need to come. Um, sadly, a woman I'm aware of who came recently to turn off um, the, uh, the ventilation so that we're keeping a child alive, um, not from COVID, I might add. So but there are people who need to come for a variety of family and indeed urgent business reasons. Um, so we can't cut ourselves off completely. And also, let's be honest, we are an exporting nation. Mm. Uh, we export all sorts of products to the world. 
and we need to be able to continue to do that. But what we need to be able to do is manage those sorts of interactions in a way that's sustainable and safe. And in order to do that, it means we need to have very uh, robust systems in place. So we need to be able to keep as much of our economy moving as is humanly possible. And certainly, I mean, I think we all understand, uh, back to the jobs point, uh, that if people can go to work and if they can continue to apply whatever is their trade, be it a mining person, someone in the automotive field, um, you know, people are in the policy space, whatever it might be, that if we can do that and keep our economy uh, ticking over, it means when the whole world can put this pandemic behind us, we're in a much better position uh, to get back in the swing globally than we would be otherwise. So we can't shut ourselves off completely. I do not believe that that is practical at all, but we have to do what we need to do really, really well. And just hold, hold that thought on the economy, Jane, because I want to do, dive a little bit deeper into that. I just want to fi finish the, the conversation about... Um, how countries are dealing with it, Rainer. Um, there are countries initially that are, that seem to deal with it quite effectively. Uh, Singapore, before they had uh, a breakout later, another wave, particularly amongst migrant workers, uh, big migrant worker populations. Taiwan was seen to have dealt with it very effectively because of lessons learned and protocols put into place after previous pandemics or epidemics. Um, South Korea as well, after initial spikes, see, seemed to deal with it and kept business open throughout. Um, what are the countries in your view who have dealt most effectively with this and why? Um, so I think China, South Korea, Vietnam, Taiwan, New Zealand um, stand out as having to, and Australia as well, you know, uh, we have to acknowledge that we, we did do a really good job um, initially. Norway. No Norway is, Norway. yeah. How many how many women leaders in those countries, Raina? <laughs> That's an interesting point. No, that 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 is an interesting point because it has been raised that the type of leadership, mm. um, the more empathetic leadership or leadership that values healthcare, um, actually may have done better. Mm. So I think the things that the, these countries did well is expand their testing capacity hugely. So Australia did that very early on. That's really critical. If you can't identify the cases, you can't control the epidemic. And that's where the US really fell down at the beginning and they never recovered from that point. Uh, and I think the testing issue still hasn't been fully sorted there. Um, the, the other thing they did was um, they didn't all use full lockdown. So China did. China used probably the most expansive lockdown ever across any country um, in Wuhan. Um, South Korea used more localised targeted lockdowns, so they didn't lock down the whole country or even a whole city. They just focused on the areas that were badly affected, which was obviously what Victoria tried at the beginning. Um, so it's a combination of those social distancing measures like lockdowns and um, testing strategy. I think some of those Asian countries also use digital contact tracing really well. Um, China and South Korea did. So they were never behind the eight ball in terms of tracking the contacts. Um, I think the political systems are an issue as well. Obviously, in a sort of country like the US where freedom and individual rights are kind of the governing principle of, of how people live their lives, it's much more difficult to get people to comply with um, public health directives. Even though every country has pretty draconian public health laws to allow you to deal with pandemics, um, we've seen armed protests in the US and you know people really rallying against having to wear masks, et cetera. Um, I think in countries that have had more authoritarian um, governments or communist governments, it's obviously they don't, they have a different um, dynamic there in terms of uh, issuing an order and having it followed. Um, so I think that has played out in terms of success. But I have to say that the, the United States, it, it shocked me. It's really shocked me. That was so unexpected that um, they would be 
really struggling so badly with with controlling this pandemic um, and the failures have been at multiple levels um, so it's really not all about resources and money um, there's much more to it than that can, can I add to that Stan because yeah, there's, yeah. there's a couple of other things I think we should think about here if you think of the list of countries who have done well I will put at this point Norway to one side there's quite a, a significance, I think, in the countries that actually had SARS as opposed to the countries that watched SARS. Uh, and I do think um, those who went through that experience, and I was the Secretary of Health during that, I think it seared itself into your very being. And I think in a lot of those countries, the systems and the understanding of what was needed, you know, immediately you uh, started to experience something of this. It was very and is very real. So I don't think we should dismiss that as being part of this. The other thing is there is much more acceptance about mask wearing in a number of these communities. And I know I'm a bit of a broken record about masks. I've been boring people all the way since the beginning about masks. And uh, in many of those countries, even if you're slightly unwell, uh, as a kind of social courtesy, you would wear a mask. And we see that amongst many of our international students where they maintain the etiquette of not basically sharing well, they perceive to be a germ that they might be carrying with anybody they might come across. So there's a social norm, which is about the acceptability of mask wearing. And we know um, that there is a tipping point. Uh, and in fact, uh, when everyone else is wearing one, if you're not wearing one, you feel slightly uncomfortable. If no one else is wearing one and you'll wear one, unless it's a socially normed behaviour, you feel uncomfortable. So I think there's a number of other things about these countries which have assisted them and we did experience at least vicariously down this part of the world SARS and I think that's part of our our response as well. Jane you mentioned female leadership and um, and, and there is also a masculine factor to this if you look at the countries that have fared less well or have had catastrophic outcomes um, they have tended to be countries with more um, macho populist leaders, America under Donald Trump, Boris Johnson, who, um, you know, initially was sceptical about the impact of it and flirted with herd immunity and ended up getting the illness himself. Bolsonaro, who's had the illness himself, and you've seen the catastrophic impact there. India under Modi, um, that those countries have fared less well. What does it tell us about leadership? Well, I think leadership that is prepared to acknowledge that there is a problem, um, to actually uh, be clear and explain to people what's going on and try and take the population with them on sometimes what has been some quite difficult decision making. Um, now, someone said to me recently, they think it's actually because those leaders, if this is a man, I might add, um, that they're more conservative. I don't believe that to be the case. I, I do think a level of trust, a level of empathy, and a capacity to explain what is going on and why things are necessary has been a standout feature of some of those countries' leadership as they have uh, worked to manage this virus. And far be it from me to suggest that the other countries that you mentioned, that mightn't be a standout feature of leadership in those places. You, you said before, Rainer, that you were really shocked at America um, and we've become so used to America as a you know a leading country when it comes to, to health breakthroughs and research and development um, uh, and of course in international leadership have you been able to satisfy in your mind where it went wrong there is there anything that jumps out at you was it a failure of politics was it a failed health system that we hear so much about was the deep inequalities that have come to exist in that country, what what in your mind contributes to this, what we're seeing in America? I think all of those things stand, but leadership has been a failure. Um, the first failure was the problem with the testing, and that was shocking to me because it's the most technologically advanced country in the world and they couldn't sort out testing. But they had all these bureaucratic hurdles. They wouldn't allow the states to develop their own tests the CDC was gatekeeping the testing at the beginning. And in the meantime, the epidemic was just growing and growing in, in Seattle and in California and other places. Um, and then by the time they allowed the states to do their own testing, the FDA blocked um, the, the approval of that testing. It was kind of a really onerous uh, 
slow process. And all of that took a long time to sort out. In the meantime, it was just everywhere in the country. And from then on, there were other failures like um, with the stockpiling, for example, um, the, what they had in the national stockpile, ventilators and so on, were, from what I understand, they were sold off to private bidders and then the states had to try and buy them off these private companies. Um, so states were competing with each other for resources. And um, then we had, we've had, you know, it's, I mean, how long is a piece of string? But we've had the CDC effectively kneecapped and silenced. You know, they're not allowed to take their normal role, which is to lead response and drive a science-based approach to the response. Um, and we've now had uh, sort of the CDC banned from providing the surveillance data, and that's been moved into health and human services. So, and then we've had, you know, non-science-based um, stuff being promoted and people, you know, being hospitalised from drinking bleach and, you know, uh, I mean, it's just the whole thing has just been, it's just been shocking and tragic really to see um, a great country that has all the resources to have done a magnificent job just, you know, do exactly the opposite. Do you have something to add to that, Jane? There's another question I want to ask you as a follow-up as well, but initially your thoughts just on what may have gone so catastrophically wrong with the US. Yes, so I think Brad has hit um, a number of the high points. I think the catastrophic failure and the inability to acknowledge that very early on in testing is an absolute fork in the road in terms of the US, but I do think some of the denials of what was actually going on, the fact it's very serious, have also been fundamental to, to the kind of fracturing we're seeing in that community. They do have some of the best scientists in the world, and Tony Fauci, um, who I think is now a kind of global name uh, and globally respected, actually, I think that the difficult thing for the real professionals there trying to navigate what is an unbelievably complicated and political approach to the response here is one of the great tragedies that we're all watching. And I, I do think it's worth remembering that the deaths in that country are a huge proportion of global deaths. And it just demonstrates if this thing uh, runs all around the world as it is there, what the potential consequences are. So it is a tragedy that we're watching. But Jane, how much blame, you know, we've, we've heard Raina give China credit for its response in the lockdown and being able to manage the spread, but how much blame does China uh, receive for the initial response to this, where we know there was allegations of secrecy, um, the whistleblower, initially the doctor who, who alerted people yeah. to this was then locked up, later died himself. So what is there blame here for China's initial response that allowed this to escape? So there is an inquiry that's looking at the origins of uh, the, the specific virus. Um, it's actually doing field work now. There's also an inquiry uh, which is looking at the response to the WHO. What do we know? Uh, that the point at which this virus actually was properly identified, the Chinese, to give them credit, did release um, the genetic sequence very quickly. They released it in early January, and that's why we now have um, pretty well along the pathway vaccine candidates. Now, what we don't know is when they actually became aware that this was a major problem. And I would acknowledge that a set of um, pneumonia deaths that look unusual, uh, the point at which that triggers an inquiry as to what they actually are caused by, that's the bit we don't know yet. And therefore, we don't know whether, in fact, there was some process of suppressing that or, in fact, whether it was just to use the vernacular, a stuff up. But we need to find out the facts on this. And I actually think a lot of people are suggesting that they know the answer, absent a proper inquiry, are probably not doing anybody any service. Uh, Rainer, I was in China during SARS and still in China during H1N1, and particularly SARS, there was, uh, there was secrecy. There was a reluctance to act and to admit the problem. What questions do you ask now about China's initial handling of this from when it first appeared to when we started to really learn about it? So I, I just, you know, I have to uh, agree with everything that Jane said. Um, uh, 
you know, epidemic diseases are unique because they increase in size exponentially. So you have one case one day, depending on the incubation period, in this case, say two one to two weeks, it'll double in one to two weeks and double and, double and keep on doubling, right? So you don't have time to um, mess around with trying to control an epidemic disease. You have, the earlier you get in, the more chance there is of stamping it out completely. So if it had been identified really early and they jumped on it, and they could have stamped it out, right? Right then, at the beginning. We don't actually know when the origin was. We've now got data from Spain saying that the, the virus was in the wastewater in March 2019. Mm -hmm. you know? um, so we don't know. There's a lot of unanswered questions about the origin of the virus. And um, there's now, you know, there's even questions about the World Military Games and the fact that several athletes from around the world who went to that in Wuhan in October um, became ill with an influenza-like illness and went back to their countries. Um, in fact, the US team flew from Seattle and back to Seattle. So that was ground zero for the US epidemic. So did it actually start from there? You know, we, we don't know. Um, and I think, I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think, in a sense, once an epidemic disease has started and caused a pandemic, you know, we, we've got limited energy. We should conserve it and use it for the fights that matter. Does it, what difference is it going to make, you know, blaming people when we don't have proper evidence or information? As Jane said, we need to wait and see what this mm -hmm. investigation shows um, before jumping to blame anyone. Um, but, yeah, in terms of China, if they had known, uh, my understanding is, you know, after SARS they built this uh, really pretty amazing surveillance mm -hmm. system that picks up um, syndromic surveillance signals from emergency departments and hospitals, et cetera, such as um, severe pneumonia of unknown cause. And my understanding is the CDC got the signal from this surveillance system coming from Wuhan that, and they realised something was going on and it was the local government there who had covered it up or not reported it. Um, and then they went in to investigate and once they realised what was going on, they told the WHO. That's my understanding. I don't know if that's the truth, but that's that's what I've pieced together. Raina, what's your considered opinion, um, and of course the investigation is, is continuing, about the origin though. Um, there's widely, I think, accepted that it began in a, a wet market as SARS or others may have, but there's also the theory that it could have it could have escaped in some way from a lab. How much credence do you give that? at all? So first of all, I don't believe it began in the wet market because there's now enough evidence that there was cases of unknown pneumonia prior to that. Mm. And only half the cases in that initial cluster in December had been to the wet market. And the first two cases from that cluster had not been to the wet market. So I don't think the evidence points to the wet market being the source. It's just where it was first noticed. Um, there is a lab in Wuhan, you know, BSL-4 lab, um, which does research on coronaviruses. Um, so it's possible, you know, it, um, it's, it's a possibility. And anyone who says it's not a possibility isn't acknowledging that there's, you know, a range of different possibilities and we don't know really what the answer is. So can, we should be clear, shouldn't we? that the evolutionary biologists who've looked at the virus itself, and I think it's important to kind of scotch this rumour, the notion that this was a created virus, mm. I think it, we need to be really clear that the evolutionary biologists who've looked at it think it is extraordinarily improbable. Now, how it got um, to the Wuhan wet market, and as Raina says, that actually there were too many cases at the Wuhan wet market, and those of us who were first hearing about this um, when we looked at the number of cases in, at the Wuhan wet market, a number of us said, well, that's not ground zero, we don't think. Uh, but in truth, uh, the fact that you're doing research, BSL-4 labs are very secure. That's the whole point of them. But this is exactly why you do an investigation. But I do think we should put up right here and now that all the advice is that this was not something that was created, but where it came from in terms of that jump from probably bats, possibly through an intermediate host, which is what is considered most likely, and then on to humans, uh, 
where that happened is unclear and needs to be properly investigated. And Jay, you've occupied a position with the executive board position with the World Health Organization. There's been a lot of criticism um, and a lot of it politically motivated, you would have to say as well, particularly from the United States. Criticism of the World Health Organization, criticism of its of its closeness to China or the Chinese Communist Party, um, and criticism of the way that it dealt with this, um, that it didn't declare a global pandemic soon enough. How yeah. much of this criticism is valid? Well, I think a couple of things are worth keeping in mind. Firstly, the WHO has no power to dictate to a sovereign government, nor does it have powers to um, steam into a country and demand actions or information or anything else. Uh, I don't think it's reasonable to declare uh, the leadership of the WHO as being too close to China. Um, the truth of the matter is when you've got something like this going on, you want to do everything you can to encourage, facilitate information, knowledge sharing, etc. As to their judgment about when they declared a pandemic, um, look, I actually regard this as being a fairly um, meaningless conversation because the truth of the matter is they were saying very clearly to the world, this is a problem. This is something you should take seriously. And I think the number of leaders who possibly weren't listening to that, uh, which now they need to say, well, actually, no, they didn't tell us this was serious. That is not a fair reflection of the messaging coming from WHO. So the fact that they did or didn't declare a pandemic at a particular point, yes, I think we acknowledge and Australia called it early, which is right in my view, but I think there's no doubt, and if you go back and look at what was said at that time, um, Mike Ryan, who sits next to, um, he only has one name, Tedros, uh, a bit like Madonna, uh, he sits at every one of those press conferences. Uh, I was having this conversation with him through January with my CEPI hat on, um, they were saying, as were we all, people involved in this space, this is nasty. This is something everyone needs to pay attention to now. What questions, someone else who has one name, Raina, who, uh, we've, as I said before, we've all come to know so well throughout this. Um, what, what questions do you ask of the WHO? Um, gosh. Uh, well, for me, I think the um, question of transmission, you know, I'd like to know, you know, initially the WHO stated that it was transmitted through droplet and contact routes, mm. but I think that was an assumption rather than based on any particular scientific data at the time. Um, and, they, you know, it took a while, but uh, WHO then commissioned a study to look at... Um, respirators, masks and eye protection and yep. distancing, which was an um, important study. And based on those findings, they took that on board and they changed their recommendations on community face mask use. Mm -hmm. um, but I think uh, around the healthcare workers, I, I still have questions. I think it is aerosolized. I think it can be transmitted through all three modes, including aerosols. And um, for healthcare workers, I think, you know, uh, really a, high, a higher level of protection is required. Uh, Raina, I, I want to ask about the lessons learned or not learned from previous pandemics. Um, you know, SARS, of course, in 2003, swine flu in 2009, 2010, and now this. You mentioned before that Asian countries particularly uh, that dealt with that and dealt with greater numbers put in protocols did we fail to, to heed those lessons? Were the warnings out there and we just thought that it wouldn't happen? Well, I think Jane was the one who pointed out that um, the countries that experienced SARS seem to have been better prepared. Um, I think everyone expected there would be a pandemic. I don't think that's the problem. Most countries have done pretty good pandemic planning, including Australia. Um, I think it was more the um, nature of the virus and the surprises that came along, um, such as asymptomatic transmission, um, failures in really high-income countries, which we didn't expect to see failures in. You know, probably in terms of global pandemic planning, we, we would have been expecting to see failures 
in low income countries and not in high income countries. But instead, you know, we saw um, the epicenter move from China to Europe and then to the United States. Um, so I think that that is something that needs to be reflected on in terms of lessons into the future, um, in terms of what we took for granted and how we can avoid um, these kind of failures again. Jane, when you reflect on previous illnesses, um, yeah. how, where do you place COVID-19? You know, a mind goes back to, to swine flu, um, which according to some estimates may have infected as much as, as many as 20% as of the, the population, over a billion people according to some estimates and yeah. hundreds of thousands we know died as well. We had SARS, um, we've had previous illnesses as well. We didn't shut down to the same extent in 2009, 2010, and now we are, and that may contribute, I think, to some of the, the mixed messaging or the confusion around this. Um, what? How do you compare this to previous illnesses and viruses and pandemics? So, so let, let's take those one by one. SARS um, was hugely catastrophic, had an enormous impact on the economy, particularly of our region. But the thing that was different about SARS was basically you were symptomatic when you were able to transmit. And we learnt that pretty quickly, and that meant that the kind of public health action uh, that was able to be taken was able to bring that under control. Now, we know it's spotted in Toronto and a number of other places, and we do know that the level of um, secrecy, and there are books that describe patients being moved from one hospital to another in front of inspection teams, it's quite quite the whodunit, but it was a very different experience because it was able, uh, once we had a bit more of a handle on what kind of disease it was and what mechanisms you could use to control it, including upping the PPE competence of healthcare workers, that enabled us to bring that under control. This is very different because of the asymptomatic transmission that Rain has already outlined. When it came to H1N1 swine flu, um, remembering that this is flu, and we already have flu virus and a capacity to produce flu vaccine. It's well-known technology. It's actually old technology. And because of the experience we've had with SARS in this country, um, and I take some credit for this, uh, we actually had pre-pandemic uh, supplies, which actually then required us to simply get the particular um, material in respect of the particular flu, the H1N1, and there's a whole history to do with the reassortment that gave us that particular virus. So we only had to do a small part of the journey when it comes to having a vaccine for H1N1. So you're right. Um, at the beginning, and we know many people were affected, there were a lot of pregnant women in this country in uh, intensive care who we were desperately worried about during that period. But because we quickly were able to produce a vaccine and quickly provide that vaccine um, to our community, uh, Nicola Roxon was very public about having her vaccine. She, she and I had a pact that we would both be vaccinated right at the beginning so we could say to people, it's safe, you need to go and do this. Uh, this is different, different sort of transmission, asymptomatic, um, no vaccine sitting on the shelf ready just to have the secret source added. So it's a very different proposition and we're looking at a much longer haul to get it under control. Do you, what do you compare this to, Rainer, and is there some value in those comparisons? Um, we've heard people speak of the Spanish flu of 1918-19, um, the impact that had. Others have pointed to the Hong Kong flu of 57-58, um, I think it was, and then there was another uh, virus in the, in the 60s as well that had a big impact. Are there comparisons that are useful? Um, in some sense, it's useful to get a sense of perspective. Um, and I think based on the case fatality rates, um, it's probably more similar to the Spanish flu than it is to 1957 or mm. 67. Um, in terms of the 2009 pandemic, the case fatality rate was orders of magnitude lower than yep. um, for SARS-CoV-2. Um, even though that, you know, like normally with seasonal flu, the 
um, the average age of death is in the 80s. But in 2009, the average age of death was in the 50s. So it was a much younger bunch of people who were dying. Um, but I've, I think the, the overall, you know, the health system wasn't exceeded the capacity. And I think overall, you know, we managed it um, comfortably within the existing resources and because of Jane's leadership, obviously. Um, but <laughs> I think the minister would see it was her leadership anyway. <laughs> You're a team. <laughs> um, but, you know, sometimes when I talk to health professional, my colleagues, you know, in the medical profession today, they don't realise there was a pandemic in 2009. They don't yes. and, 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 and the media yeah. as well that yeah. seems to have forgotten this. Yeah. A lot of people don't, when you tell them, oh, but we had a pandemic in 2009, people don't remember. So that's how much impression it left on people. Let, let's, let's deal with this question of a vaccine, Rainer. Are we going to get one? I think there's a probably 90% chance we will, yes, based on the phase one trials that we've seen the results for and some of the early data that's coming out. And I think the, the other issue is that the efforts to develop a vaccine are unprecedented. Never before have we seen this scale of effort um, globally and collaborations that have never happened before, including between pharmaceutical giants working together. So I think just because of the um, level of um, focus and resources and um, um, effort that's, that's being uh, undergone at the moment, I think it's very likely we'll see vaccines. How good they are, they will be, I don't know, they'll probably be okay. I think that we'll have vaccines that are reasonable enough um, to um, provide herd immunity. Are you optimistic, Jane, similarly, and, and can you do just clarify for us when we we talk about a vaccine we, you know, we have this idea of a of a silver bullet something that comes along and just eradicates it and we can take it and we'll never ever get it again and, you know uh, i'm not a scientist but i know that that is not how it works are you optimistic and how would a vaccine in fact work yeah so I, i'm cautiously optimistic which was um you know i'm a conservative person when it comes to uh these things we know that there are over 250 groups working on a vaccine. It's a big number, but most importantly, there are well over 20 candidate vaccines that are currently in human trial around the world and more in preclinical work. And we know that the early signs on a number of those are quite positive. When we talk about the effectiveness of a vaccine, it's important to remember that some vaccines are highly effective in individuals. You're going to get 80 or 90 percent of the people who get that vaccine having a response that gives them protection. Flu vaccine tends to be um, low. It depends from year to year. But if you have enough people take that vaccine and it has enough efficacy, then you will end up with the kind of herd immunity we need to suppress this kind of uh, pandemic. So the work that I do globally on vaccines, um, we are cautiously optimistic. We are worried uh, that we will have enough produced in a timely fashion and that we will be able to access it. But I think um, at the moment, we're feeling positive that there are um, enough candidates that look positive that we will get at least one. And my preference would be more than one. What's the time frame, Jane? Well, I, mean, I know it's a race against time, but what, what, what's the best and earliest um, estimate of when we could actually have one? So, so I think this is a really important thing for people to get their heads around. One of the things we need to do is make sure not only that it works, but it's safe. And if we have a vaccine that causes damage to people, um, that is not a vaccine that we want to use. Uh, we have to balance off efficacy and safety against what is actually the consequence of the disease. So uh, the, that means you need to do uh, all of your trials properly. You need to have proper data and you need to be able to see the effectiveness of a vaccine in a large group of people over a period of time in order that you know exactly uh, how it works. So certainly CEPI, which is the organisation I chair, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, which is a mouthful, um, we, we have been saying consistently through this period that you would not anticipate uh, getting significant numbers of doses at the earliest for 18 months, in other words, at some point next year. People will hear reports of vaccines being registered for use before they finish those phase three trials. 
I can tell you that I would not be comfortable uh, taking a vaccine of that kind. Um, I want to see the data. I want to be confident that a competent regulator has looked at it really thoroughly and has said, I think this is safe and efficacious and can and should be used. So notwithstanding the fact that I think um, President Trump is uh, prognosticating about um, millions of doses this year in the United States, let's remember we need a min minimum of 2 billion people vaccinated. And I think that tells you that we're talking late next year and into the year following. Rona, is this a dangerous period too, the, as expectations are so high and people are so desperate for a vaccine that we would see corners being cut? We've heard reports of a Russian vaccine um, potentially releasing that before stage three trials have even finished. Um, there are questions about the safety of a vaccine. We know how devastating an unsafe vaccine would be. Is this also, also a quite a, a dangerous period? Yes, so there are, as as you've said, there are reports. There are, there's a possibility that some countries may cut corners, um, uh, but I think you know, as Jane said, it's really important that vaccines follow through all the proper clinical trials process to establish safety, immunogenicity, and then efficacy in humans. And uh, even after you do that, you can still find adverse events that happen that are too um, infrequent to be detected by the clinical trials but only become apparent when pe when populations start getting vaccinated um that happened with the very first rotavirus vaccine you know the clinical trials didn't pick up a safety signal but when it started being used in the us kids started getting this serious side effect so um i think it is it is a dangerous period you know we've seen already seen a bit of uh some cutting of corners with various drugs and um, miracle cures for COVID-19. So, so we need to be careful. So when, when you hear reporting that Russia is, you know, uh, approving the world's first COVID-19 vaccine, and that's been reported out of Russia, you'd be very, you'd be very skeptical and cautious of anything right now that, that made those particular claims or said that they had something ready to be administered. I'd want to see the data. You know, I'd want to see the published clinical trial data. And, and Jane, is there a difficulty too um, in in who gets the vaccine? Are we going to see hoarding? Are we going to see countries say that, you know, we'll look after ourselves first? And once again, and, and this has been something that's been a, a feature of COVID, that the most vulnerable suffer the greatest. Yes. So I've been out um, globally talking about vaccine nationalism and there's a very good piece in, uh, from the Council on Foreign uh, Relations out of the US by Thomas Boyke uh, on vaccine nationalism, which I would commend to people to read. Uh, there is a real risk that there will be hoarding and there'll be a, there's a real risk that vaccine will be used for strategic purposes uh, by countries uh, if they think that they have the only supply or they are in a privileged position. And I think we need to call that out. Uh, the truth of the matter is when anyone in the world has this disease, this virus, everyone's still got it. And we know uh, in terms of the behaviour we've already seen on PPE where there have been export bans slapped on in, from a number of countries, including the United States, uh, that those bans uh, were about protecting domestic populations and not considering uh, what the implications are for the world. And this is my point about who should get the vaccine first. Two billion people, the elderly, first responders, our healthcare workers, the immune compromised, people who are vulnerable. If we can vaccinate those people early uh, when a safe vaccine becomes available, we actually bring down morbidity and mortality in a way that is going to make a huge difference to the world. And so that's one of the things we are arguing for globally but I can't control sovereign governments or indeed companies, although the companies we work with, we're being very clear with, we will call out uh, bad behaviour if they don't acknowledge there is a global need here. So, but yes, it's a huge risk. It just had a, a question come in and it's, it's a good one. Um, Jane, if you could just provide that article again on on uh, vaccine nationalism. Who wrote it and where could people access so, that? Thomas Boyke, um, and I won't spell his last name correctly, but if you look up the Council on Foreign Relations, which I think is based in New York, uh, 
uh, you will find it. It's been published in the last probably week. In fact, I was uh, on a call with him only very recently, just as it had been released. So it's very current. And if you look up vaccine nationalism, I think it will probably also find it for you. Right. What are your concerns, Rainer, about this? And how do we ensure that if there is a vaccine, that people get it and that we can produce it in the quantities at the cost as well that people can access it? Yeah, look, I think it is going to be a problem. You know, there's no two ways about it. There are some countries that are more powerful, more wealthy, who probably, you know, buy up whatever they can, um, leaving other countries that are poorer, that don't have as many resources or as much political clout, um, waiting in line for a long time, uh, and they will rely on organisations like the WHO and the COVAX initiative, which Jane can talk about, which is really important to ensure equitable distribution of vaccine. Um, but each country as well is planning for their own population. You know, in the end, politicians answer to their to the the populace and the people who vote them in. And um, you know, I don't think equity will will cut it in the next election. Uh, equity on a global sense. That's the problem. The tension between national interest versus global um, public health. Um, in the end, it's better that we control the disease globally for everyone, because as long as it's uncontrolled in the world, it'll always continue to cause a problem for every country. Um, hey Jane, that, that, that raises questions um, about the geopolitical implications of this. Mm -hmm. I think someone once said that a pandemic is a social crisis with a, with a medical component, um, because it does impact every aspect of our lives and it's going to impact our lives politically as well. Um, we know that going into coronavirus, there was great tensions brewing between the two big powers, the United States and China. There was a trade war. There's been increasing rhetoric. The United States declared China a strategic um, competitor, and that really has tipped the balance in terms of how that how that relationship is going forward. Um, do you see COVID nineteen as being something that is accelerating these issues? And what are your concerns about? how this impacts globally and, and politically? Well, certainly it is accelerating them. I and all you have to do is look around the world and see the level of instability and uncertainty, the level of civil unrest in a number of countries and the level of um, uh, fractured dialogue between countries to know that that's the case. And if you think about the race for a vaccine as being the equivalent of an arms race, and I would argue it is that at the moment, because what you're looking for is the opportunity uh, to use a, a product for strategic advantage. And as Raina says, uh, certainly I'm arguing globally for the importance of public health and the advantage we will all have socially, economically, et cetera, um, if we get this virus under control. But there are broader issues at play here. And certainly I think we know this in our region the strategic advantage that comes with being able to say to potentially a smaller country, we can help you, we can look after your needs here, but there are strings attached. I think that is a very real risk. Uh, I mean, you know, at a time when um, our borders are our salvation, um, that does increase precisely the thing that you're trying to speak against, and that is this more virulent nationalism um, that morphs into a populism around a response to COVID-19, but in a sense, you're speaking against the, the age, against the zeitgeist, that nationalism is back in, and back in a big way. And our Prime Minister himself had said that sovereignty matters. Sovereignty yeah. certainly does matter now. Yeah, sovereignty does matter. But again, I think there is a level of enlightened self-interest in this because the truth of the matter is um, you can vaccinate your entire population for uh, the 80% of people that you vaccinate who are not in those categories I just went to, uh, the implications are probably not as significant as if you potentially assisted uh, your neighbours and your friends and your trading partners to get this disease under control. So I think you're right, the risk is yet more um, logs on the fire of nationalism. But in truth, uh, 
uh, nationalism can also express itself as protecting the economic well-being of your citizens and actually being able to go about your business in the world in the way that you would like. So I think I think there's a way of framing this discussion that if we don't put these issues out there now, the risk is exactly as we've outlined, that all those worst features will be what we will see played out over the next 12 to 18 months. And Rader, in some ways, this is analogous to, to climate change, isn't it? That there are um, vested interests and national interests versus the global interest in getting people to act globally is both critical to dealing with it, but also the biggest stumbling block. And we've seen the United States pull out of the Paris Accords and we've seen previous agreements that weight the burden on other countries greater than, than, than some other countries. Um, what are your concerns about the geopolitical fallout of this and how that may impact the fight against coronavirus? Um, well, it's obviously the um, tensions between the US and China are a major concern. Um, and that's sort of become, that's been exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, you know, the last thing we need is further conflict or war on top of a pandemic. Um, the other issues, I guess, are around, again, the, you know, national interest versus global um, concerns and related to trade and supply chains, um, whether, uh, you know, countries like China will, will sort of have, will change in a, in a major way because other countries stop um, importing from them and uh, develop their own resilience um, domestically. And certainly large countries like the US can afford to build their own um, domestic economy in a way, you know, going back to manufacturing and um, other industries that they've sort of... Um, I'm just, just trying to be very cautious in how I say it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, well Jane, I mean, there, there is a question here. When you look at the, the big great power rivalry of our age, United States versus China, is, is, there, is there a question to be asked here about who emerges from this stronger? Is the United States fundamentally weakened uh, by coronavirus and, and China emerging out of this in a stronger position? Well, you'd certainly say that the state of American democracy is not possibly what we would wish. And certainly we see uh, scenes, I think, every day that cause us great concern and distress about the capacity of, you know, what's been the leader of the free world uh, to, to look after its own population, to, to actually steward uh, its friends and it's together with its own self-interest at a time which is so, so fraught but you know there, there's one little thing i'd like to point out about where there is potentially an opportunity here because i mean whilst there's a, a an arms race for a vaccine nobody yet knows which ones are going to work and which ones are going to work first so unlike with h1n1 where uh, we knew how to make flu vaccine and providing we had enough stock, we could get on and do it. And that puts some countries in a privileged position. At the moment, as yet, and I'm discounting the Russian announcement, um, nobody actually has a viable vaccine, which means there's an argument for countries to collaborate because at the end of the day, do you take a bet on one or two and possibly miss out? Or do you work in a collaborative mechanism to actually make sure that you have access to something that will work. And I think this is one of the great um, challenges of this time, and this is one of the things that we're actually doing with COVAX, is build a mechanism to bring together, and it's, it's medium-sized countries, let's be really clear, um, together with people who the Global Alliance on Vaccines and Immunisation, Gavi, would service, so people in low and middle-income countries to actually get ourselves into those supply chains and acknowledging the risk of export control, but actually make sure that those countries do get access. So we've got huge major power conflict potentially, or certainly argument um, about uh, this and the response. But at the same time, 
these medium-sized countries are carving a bit of their own path, and I think that's a good thing. What a talk in the last 15 minutes we have about the, this new normal or whatever it might look like. And, and Jane, um, then I'll come to you, Rayna, but th there have to be questions asked, don't there, about if we're 18 months from a vaccine, if the best, you know, the best outcome is we get one towards the middle or back end of next year and we have an ongoing fight against this illness that continues to pop up, um, at what point do we have to make decisions about uh, what we prioritise. Um, we can't just keep shutting down the economy, can we? We can't just keep endlessly bailing people out. We can't endlessly, the government can't afford end endless um, support measures and stimulus measures and taking on increasing debt when, you know, you have a global depression on us right now. So, you know, does this new normal, what choices are going to have to be made and what priorities will there be? Yeah, so, so this is actually a really important point. And again, I think we come back to messaging because a lot of this is actually in the hands of everyday Australians. Um, we know that some things work in terms of limiting transmission. And put aside the um, aggressive suppression, no community-based transmission just for a se second, if we might because there's always the potential there will be some virus somewhere, even if we get to um, zero transmission. But essentially the question is, can everybody be motivated, sufficiently informed and equipped to do these things that we know work? How is it we change behaviour? Now, we've, we're good at this. We've done it with kids wearing hats in playgrounds. We've done it with slip, slop, slap. We've done it with cigarette smoking, which we've pulled way down. We've done it with a whole series of things. So why can't we do that again? Because the, the offer, the promise to everybody is not just looking after granny. It's also being able to go to work. It's being able to have a bit of a social engagement. But it is not, as Rainer, I think, has alluded to, doing what I've seen um, in a number of places people out and about behaving as if nothing ever happened. Because if that happens, we will have it everywhere and very quickly. And it is not, I regret to say, going on, on a pub crawl around seven venues in the one night, because that is exactly what happened in Korea, which sparked their second wave. And sadly, and I know it's really hard for younger people who are used to going out and having a great time. I mean, I love to go out and have a great time too, but for the next little while, but I think it's in our hands. And that does enable us, because you're right, Stan. Um, governments, the well is not bottomless, and it will come down to that trade-off between what governments can manage to afford and what people are prepared to do. Raina, can, can we do this? And does the new normal uh, mean that we have to accept that um, we're going to have double-digit unemployment, that we're going to have businesses that have gone to the wall, um, people who can't pay their rent, who can't pay their mortgages, kids who can't go to school. Um, and we know ultimately that that affects the most vulnerable. If you're, you know, I'm fortunate that my two boys have been here studying remotely, but we have a comfortable home. And we have good internet coverage and everyone has their own, their own room and we have a study. And, you know, I mean, people who don't have that are going to feel this. Does the new normal mean that, you know, there are greater inequalities and the most vulnerable suffer the most? Yes, I think so. Uh, and I think we That's a terrible to... thought, isn't it? It is. I think we have to start um, preparing for different scenarios and, you know, uh, even looking at things like a wartime economy where people who may have lost their jobs could be... Um, you know, provided opportunities in making essential medical supplies. You know, uh, Australia has actually done really well in, um, you know, starting uh, manufacturing of masks and respirators, for example, um, in several companies that were making other kinds of things previously. We've had companies who were uh, distilleries, you know, making um, hand sanitizers. And so I think there are, you know, um, where there's been a downturn, there's also been other industries that have, um, become more needed and more um, valuable during the pandemic. And if we can have some strategic thinking around how we can reshape the economy, at least 
you know, internally as best as we can um, using that sort of wartime economy model that might be something that will build some resilience to what lies ahead. You've been on the inside of, of government. You've been where these decisions are made, Jane. How does the government now navigate this? I mean, The Economist magazine um, had a headline recently, the 90% economy. That's, that's what the new normal will be. 10% of what we have known will be gone. Uh, we know the industries that are most hard hit, service industries, um, retail industries, our tourism industry. Um, the, the decisions that government is going to have to make and what Rona is talking about there with wartime economy, um, putting people to work in different ways. How do you go about even making these decisions and adjusting to an economic outlook that is so radically diminished? Well, what you start by doing is um, looking very creatively at what you have as assets. Um, you think about how long this is going to go on for. You bolster uh, for particularly the young people who have been so affected by this. You bolster the opportunities for retraining and education. The truth of the matter is um, if we're going to have this time where there isn't as many opportunities that they might like, well, we need to basically make sure they have the best opportunities coming out of this as we can. You actually say to yourself, well, you know, the net difference in the tourism spend of Australians, and I'm not talking business travel here, tourism, uh, we spend more uh, going out of Australia than people who spend uh, from overseas spend coming to Australia. And the delta, the difference between those two numbers is $20 billion. So if we can get um, Australians doing, frankly, the patriotic thing, uh, but also if they've got the capacity to go and have a look at those places in their state or as we have more relaxation domestically around the country that they've never gotten around to going to see, I'm very privileged that I've seen a huge part of this country and the jobs that I've had. But for many Australians, it would be a revelation to go to the Kimberley. It would be a revelation to go to, to uh, bits of the New South Wales South Coast. I mean, there are things to see and do in Australia. So I think it's that kind of creative thinking. It isn't going to be uh, life as we knew it. But let's get creative. Let's invest in our young people. Let's uh, keep as many of those businesses going, even if it's refocused in the way that they operate. Let's keep our exports going um, because that is a continuing source of income to us as a country. Um, and let's prepare for what the world will look like when we come out the other side. Uh, Rona, when we talk about a new normal, what about the social change? You know, when you cannot hug your parents or visit your parents in a nursing home? What are the futures of things like aged care homes? Do we see more people bringing their aging relatives into their own homes, um, working from home? How is that going to change uh, our, our lives? Um, the fact that we can't shake hands, the fact that we don't see people's faces because they're wearing masks changes the nature of our interaction. How do you see the, the social change we're going to have to live through with coronavirus, the impact it will have on us. So you've covered a lot of things there, Stan. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, I think generally human beings are really resilient and adaptable. I think we'll adapt and we'll change the way we live. Um, we have to to survive, and I think we will. Um, it's already happened. You know, people have. We've had the technology to work from home for so long. Nobody uses it, you know. We've had the technology to have virtual meetings for so long. Nobody uses it. And guess what? We can use it successfully, you know. I think also businesses will probably realise that they don't need to spend as much on sending their staff travelling all over the place, that you can efficiently have meetings virtually. Um, and they save a lot of money on rentals, on expensive properties, if people work from home. So I think we may see permanent changes in the way that we work and live um, as a result of the pandemic. Do you think that uh, we will see a return to the office, Jane? And what does that do to, you know, to the way that we live? Downtown is going to change. You know, you go to downtown Sydney um, and it's just not the same anymore. And that affects the businesses that rely mm -hmm. on that city-based trade. If people are living... Uh, more remotely from the office? How does that change the nature of work? Uh, 
you know, the, the choices. Do we see people moving to regional areas? And then that's going to mean that we have to look at changes to industrial relations laws, HR practices, things such as internet connection, which is critical if you're going to live and work remotely. How do you see all of those things playing out? Yeah, well, isn't it great that we have much better internet now and that this didn't happen 10 years ago because all of those Zoom calls we've all gotten so good at would have been... This conversation, <laughs> we wouldn't be able to have. Uh, so, I, look, it's undoubtedly the case. This has accelerated the digital um, transformation of how we do what we do, where we do it, when we do it, and with whom we do it. Uh, now, is it always an adequate substitute for seeing real people I would argue um, that not always, and I actually would argue that there'll be a mix. We will find a sweet spot in there somewhere where sometimes, you know those meetings you go to where actually the sidebar conversation is as important or occasionally more important than the direct discussion you have. So what we're going to find, I think, is people will look at what their business is. They'll see what is going to work. But I agree with you. Um, the truth of the matter is, People will probably work in all sorts of different ways and places than they had historically. I think for many people, it will mean a, an opportunity to balance off other parts of their lives in ways that they weren't always able to. So there's positives here, but we don't net know, I think, what that good balance is going to be. At the moment, it, we're all doing it out of necessity. Um, I have to say that when I got on a plane a couple of days ago, it was the first time I had been on a plane since March. And it was quite the surreal experience. So for someone who has spent her whole life professionally traveling all the time, um, I can't say that uh, I was desperate to go back to that routine, but there will be some of that in what I go back to when we come out the other side, I'm sure. But I do think we will consider more thoughtfully, we will position ourselves in terms of what is going to work best. And undoubtedly, all those things that you talk about, they will be in the frame for change. And Rona, it's also going to exacerbate, isn't it, existing tensions. Um, we've seen a political polarisation in pl places like the United States in the midst of coronavirus. We've seen the Black Lives Matter protests in the US. And we've seen Black Lives Matter protests here. And that's become a flashpoint, too, for criticism around, you know, how do we allow this? I mean, protest is a democratic right that doesn't change because we're in the middle of a pandemic, and yet there are health implications. For that, for that pandemic. Um, how, how do we allow people to go watch a football game, but you can't go to watch a, a concert in a, or, or go to the theatre? Um, it, it's also creating tensions around who are winners and who are losers and who has rights and who has the right to have rights, if you like. Yeah, uh, and there have been some inconsistencies in how those... Um, rules have been applied, I think, in terms of public events. Um, I think generally, though, um, outdoor events can be held reasonably safely compared to indoor events uh, with large numbers of people, particularly if everyone's wearing a mask. Um, for example, the Black Lives Matters protests in Melbourne occurred more than two incubation periods before the um, resurgence in Melbourne, so clearly they did not result in any um, increase in cases. And when you look at the photographs, most people were wearing masks. Um, you know, I think in Queensland, the police were actually handing out masks to protesters. Um, so I think we can, again, uh, we can do some of those things if we adapt and use some of the mitigation strategies like masks and social distancing and going and getting tested. And just a final thought from you, Jane, on, on, on that as well. Um, the, the inconsistencies or, or the tensions around which industries get more support. Um, sport certainly is, appears to be getting greater consideration and support than the arts, for instance. Um, uh, and that may be in, uh, because these events are held outside or, or not. But, but part of this, as... The, as we live with the imposition of this virus is dealing with those those tensions at a social level too, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And look, I think it doesn't matter which decision you make at the moment, if you're in government, you're going to be criticised. I mean, essentially what we want to do is make sure that people can have some enjoyment. Uh, and we know that sport for so many people is so important. And I think to give the teams of the various codes credit, 
they have really gone all out to make sure that they can uh, practice their craft. But for all governments, these are line ball calls very often, and the arts is the, the arts is a real issue. And I know that there's been new uh, measures to provide assistance with the arts and people being really creative, as you would expect. But we do have to continue to struggle with these ideas and make sure that we keep all of these parts of our our lives, our economy, uh, our social and emotional beings, which uh, of course rely on all of these elements. We have to keep them all. Uh, so that when we come out the other side that they can re-emerge fully formed. It's been an absolute pleasure to, to speak to both of you. There's been some fantastic questions and comments coming in and we've tried to reflect a lot of those concerns in the conversation, but everybody is saying um, how refreshing and how inspiring it's been to have people like yourselves here who deal in facts and deal in science and have empathy uh, and have a big world view as well to be able to bring to this conversation. It's, uh, it's been terrific to speak to both of you. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. And